This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Hedge Despite the number of pop culture references we often include in these episodes of ours, we here at the Word of the Week are not quick to follow the latest cultural trends. Even when those trends coincide with our interests in fantasy and science fiction. We've had our hearts broken a few too many times by committing ourselves to some popular television show, book series, movie franchise, video game series, or tabletop role-playing game system, only to have the thing turn out to be, well, not good. Or to have it start out good and then take a turn for the worse. Or worst of all, to genuinely like something only to discover that we are apparently alone in liking it and so watch it get cancelled before it gets anywhere. Alas, poor middleman and pushing daisies. We miss you. Please come back. The point is, we don't like to overcommit ourselves to any sort of entertainment media until we know it's going to be good, or at least until we know it's going to come to some kind of satisfying conclusion. We like to hedge our bets. Which is, by the way, exactly what that phrase means, or what it used to mean. Nowadays, sure, it means to mitigate the risk you take on a gamble by placing other smaller gambles whose winnings will hopefully cover any losses you suffer on the main gamble. But that financial definition, which has been around since the 1620s when moneylenders hedged their debts by securing one loan against another, was actually just an evolution of an older meaning. That meaning, most notably used in Shakespeare's Merry Wives of Windsor, was to equivocate, vacillate, or avoid commitment, as in the line, I myself sometimes, leaving the fear of God on the left hand and hiding mine honor in my necessity, am fain to shuffle, to hedge to lurch. And even before Shakespeare used it, the word hedge was frequently used as a verb that basically meant to avoid overcommitting or to leave a path of retreat. So when it comes to popular media, we at the Word of the Week tend to hedge our commitments to franchises. That's why we're only just now, and for reference, now is May and June of 2019. We're only just now working our way through the Marvel Cinematic Universe and also why we are currently reading our way through George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire series of fantasy novels, which we hear has, at some point in the last decade, been made into a major cable television series, and whose final season is just now wrapping up? Boy, are people talking about that ending. So it must be good. Please don't spoil it for us. If you are somehow more clueless than we are, or you are even more cautious about committing to new series than we are, you may not know what we're going on about. Though we did talk about this series briefly before. A Song of Ice and Fire is a series currently consisting of five massive historical fantasy novels written by American author and screenwriter George Raymond Richard Martin. He wrote the first book, A Game of Thrones, back in the early 1990s, though it wasn't published until 1996, and it was originally meant to be the first of three books. Now, more than two decades later, he's planning to wrap the story up in two more books, which are coming soon, and have been coming soon for, well, a while, as near as we can tell. When Martin began writing this series, he was already an accomplished author and had primarily focused on short fiction. He had received a number of Hugo and Nebula awards for short science fiction and fantasy stories he'd written starting in 1971 and throughout the early 1990s. In the 1980s, he worked as a scriptwriter for a variety of television shows, notably a revived Twilight Zone series but he was frequently frustrated by the fact that no one wanted to make any of his original show ideas. He'd written numerous scripts for pilots, but none of them sold. Budgetary restrictions on the shows he worked on also kept him from realizing the grand epic scope of his artistic vision. And so he left Hollywood to start work on his own epic series of books. That was in 1991. Now, Martin was a big fan of Tolkien's work, and he wanted to do something on a similar scope and scale. 
but he didn't have any specific story ideas. The only idea rattling around in his head was a single scene about a young boy witnessing the execution of a criminal and then finding some dire wolves in the snow. His writing was frequently interrupted by various projects, and it took him three years to finish the first book and a further two years for it to see publication. And by the time he'd finished it and sold his agent on the idea of a trilogy, he'd decided he needed six books to tell the story. And now he's up to seven. Well, seven planned books. He's still only written five, and he's stopped promising any release dates because he kept getting in trouble with his fans every time he missed a deadline. Speaking of hedging his bets... The series itself is very much steeped in British and European history. It takes place in the fictional land of Westeros, and it involves several concurrent plot lines. First, there's a series of brutal succession wars over the throne of Westeros between various noble houses. It's all court intrigue and politics, and a lot of it was inspired by real-world historical events. Most notably, the fictional battle for the future of Westeros that involves the noble houses of Stark and Lannister is very similar in a number of ways to a series of conflicts for the English throne known as the War of the Roses. Those wars, fought between 1455 and 1487, primarily involved the noble houses of York and Lancaster, both of whose coat of arms depicted a rose, the Red Rose of Lancaster and the White Rose of York. Second, there's the invasion of Westeros from the north by unified tribes of so-called free folk who were driven into the northern lands and then kept out by a massive wall much the same way that the peoples of the British Isles, who would not submit to Roman rule, were kept out by Emperor Hadrian's Wall. And then there's the story of the last scion of House Targaryen, who conquered and united Westeros. In much the way William the Conqueror conquered England in 1066, and whose dynasty was driven out of England in the One Hundred Years' War. The point is, the whole series is as well known for its authenticity and its grounding in real-world middle to late medieval politics as it is for its ice zombies and dragons and brutal violence. And that's why we're bringing it up today. Because we've just about finished the third book in the series and we've recently gotten to know certain characters. Most notably the fallen knight Beric Dondarrion and his motley crew of outlaws. And Martin keeps bringing up a certain historical archetype, and we found ourselves getting very curious about the reality of that said type of character. Just what is the deal with the Hedge Knight? As presented in Martin's series, in the spin-off series of books known as The Tales of Dunk and Egg, the Hedge Knight is a knight, a mounted soldier, who owes no particular oath of fealty to any lord. Instead, they travel from place to place, hiring themselves to anyone who will pay them, or else competing in tournaments for renown, coin, and work. Some have chosen the life, while others have been left orphaned, as it were, when their lord was killed in battle. Beric Dondarrion himself once served King Robert Baratheon before his death in the first book, and now is a knight without a lord. So what is a hedge knight? Were there real hedge knights? And why are they called hedge knights? What do they have to do with hedges? Spoiler alert. Yes, they were real, but they were pretty rare for the most part, except during certain historical periods. And they've been terribly romanticized, like many things having to do with knights. To start with, and to understand our skepticism, we have to understand how a knight became a knight. See, knight training was a long and difficult process, and it started as early as seven years old. A child would enter the service of a lord or knight as a page, and as a page they'd start learning all of the skills they'd need to serve a lord in battle. Physical conditioning was a big part of the process, as was combat training, though pages were trained with undersized training weapons. Remember, as we discussed in our episode about the paladin, that a knight was a mounted soldier. That was their role. They rode a horse into battle. In fact, the word cavalry comes from the word chivalry, which comes from the word cavalier. So combat training and horsemanship were a big part of the process. 
Pages were often trained to ride pigs, so they would develop the balance needed to ride a horse in combat later. And they would also learn to hold a lance. They would hold the lance, called couching the lance, and sit astride a wheeled frame with a saddle, and the said frame would be pulled at a target. After seven years of training as a page, the young knight would become a squire. Squire, by the way, is a shortening of the word esquire, which comes from a French word and means shield-bearer. And the title referred to the fact that the squire would accompany their master, a knight or lord, on their military campaigns and help them don their armor and prepare for battle. They would continue to train, of course, when there wasn't a war on, and their training was much more dangerous. Injuries were more common. Squires might even see battle occasionally when accompanying their master into battle. They learned additional skills like battlefield strategy and siege warfare, and their endurance was greatly tested. After seven more years of serving as a squire, at the age of twenty-one, the young man would be raised to the status of knight. The ceremonies involved varied from place to place. In the early medieval period, it was a ceremony between the liege lord and the knight. Later on, as the church came to play a more prominent political role, the ceremony took on religious trappings as well. But one common feature in most knighting ceremonies was a dubbing. That is, where the knight would receive a blow from their master, a blow with the flat side of a sword, typically. It was the only blow a knight was allowed to receive without returning. And it signified the knight's unquestioning loyalty. As time went on, this ceremony got softened to the more commonly known tap on each shoulder with a sword. Given all of this training and investment, it seems odd to think of a masterless knight. And that's especially true given the sheer cost of a warhorse, armor, and weapons required for a knight. Knights were expected to own and maintain their own horses, they often had several, their own armor, and their own weapons. Thus, most knights came from noble families who could afford to provide such things. And the relationships between noble families are also what created the opportunity to train as a knight in the first place. Often a lord or knight would agree to take on another family's child as a page as a way of cementing a relationship between those families. So, how could there be hedge knights at all? Well, there were a couple of ways that a knight could end up without a liege. What you have to understand is that while there was a great deal of wealth required to maintain knighthood, it wasn't actually a hereditary thing. Anyone could be raised to the status of a knight, and when a liege recognized someone's contributions in battle by conferring on them the status of a knight, they would often be given a grant. In the early to middle medieval period, this grant was normally a land grant. They'd be given a small plot of land, an estate. Recall from some of our previous episodes that most wealth during this period didn't exist as cash. It existed instead as land. So knights who were land rich and cash poor did happen. And as time wore on and cash transactions became more common, a knight working for coin was entirely possible. Then too, as we discussed in our episode about mercenaries with the Protestant Reformation in the Thirty Years' War, the Holy Roman Empire basically fell apart in Europe. The church had lost all of its political power and there was a massive power vacuum. War, famine, and civil unrest swept across Europe. Many bonds were broken, and so many knights took to raiding and pillaging to survive those that didn't hired themselves out as mercenaries. And so, the first mercenaries were, in fact, what George R. R. Martin would call hedge knights. And he didn't even make up the term. See, the word hedge, with which we started off this episode, isn't just a verb. It's also been used throughout history as an adjective and affixed to a profession. As fantasy fans, we often hear the terms hedge witch or hedge wizard, and you might even hear it in reference to other things. As an adjective, it actually means inferior or lesser, and that meaning comes literally from the idea of being born or coming from beside or under a hedge. Yes, as in a row or wall made of plants. This use of hedge goes back to Roman times, but it actually, like so many things in Martin's books, has a very strong connection to British history. See, hedges or hedgerows are kind of synonymous with the particular checkerboard look of the English pastoral countryside. 
which is something a lot of folks in Britain romanticize. The Romans were among the first Europeans to use hedgerows to mark the boundaries of properties and fields. The very first such hedgerows were probably unintentional. They appeared as a result of clearing land for farming up to a certain point and leaving a little uncleared land between one field and the next. Naturally, this would result in a snarl or tangle of plants to mark the boundary. Regardless, the Romans eventually started the practice of planting rows of plants to mark field and property boundaries, and they brought it into England with them. Of course, when you think of hedges, you think of neat rectangular walls of plants. The Roman hedges weren't like that at all. They liked to use thorny plants, especially hawthorn, which grow together into snarly thorny barricades. After the Romans retreated from England around 400 CE, the practice of using hedgerows slowed, but then Germanic Anglo-Saxons showed up around 500 CE and continued the practice for a while, but it dropped off again. It didn't pick up again until the 13th and then the later 15th century, during the first of the British enclosure movements. The British enclosure movements, and there have been several, were precisely what they sound like. They were political movements dedicated to partitioning the land into private parcels, enclosing properties, as it were and they marked a changing attitude toward land ownership in England that is, frankly, more complicated and more socially significant than you'd expect from a movement that basically involved planting hedges around your farm. Now, the 13th and 15th century movements were little spurts, precursors to the big one. That real movement would start in the 1600s, grow into a big deal with industrialization in the 1800s, and result in the passing of over five thousand individual acts of parliamentary law that turned commonly owned public land on which anyone could graze livestock or tend crops into private land that could only be worked by a landlord or his employees. Now, the British enclosure thing is pretty significant, and it had some important impacts on people, both good and bad. On the negative side, lots of poor folks were displaced or jobless when they lost access to what used to be common land. Many had to leave the countryside and start working in the factories in the city. Of course, that pushed people into terrible working conditions and led to overcrowding in the cities. But it did also spur the Industrial Revolution onward. On the positive side, though, it greatly improved agricultural output across England. And to understand that, you have to understand an economic theory called the tragedy of the commons. And this theory, first written about by an Oxford economist named the Reverend William Forster Lloyd in 1833, was cited as one of the major reasons to push for the Enclosures Acts of the time. Imagine there's a parcel of common land. Anyone can use it, and they can let their sheep graze on it. The community shares the use of the land. In this community, there are ten shepherds, and each has ten sheep. But then, one shepherd gets the bright idea of getting an extra sheep and letting it graze. It's common land, right? No rules. And the land can probably support one more sheep. The shepherd with the extra sheep takes a little bit more profit because of the extra wool. It's fine. But then someone else decides to add another sheep. And so does someone else. And suddenly, instead of a hundred, there's a hundred and ten. Or a hundred and thirty. Or whatever. Now, the grass is starting to get ratty and bare, and the sheep don't have as much good grass to eat. The sheep are getting skinnier and their coats are getting more threadbare. Everyone is a little worse off. That's the tragedy of the commons. When something belongs to everyone, there's an incentive for everyone to overexploit it. And no one is responsible for making sure it's being used efficiently or maintaining it or whatever. And eventually that leads to tragedy for everyone. Once a resource belongs to one person, they maintain it, they use it more efficiently, and they generate more wealth, not just for themselves, but for everyone. If all those sheep on the commons die, there's no wool to be had for anyone. But if a private shepherd is using the land well and producing wool, everyone can buy wool. 
And that's why there was a sudden surge in agricultural production in England as a result of the privatization of the land. But back to the hedges. Most of the hedges that give the English countryside its characteristic look and charm were planted during this period, between 1600 and 1900, give or take. Even though they hearken back to a romantic notion of the pre-industrial, pre-Victorian medieval world. And that's also what happened with the hedge knight. The knight who had meager means or was low born on the side of the road and slept under hedges made his money by mercenary work, or often by raiding and plundering and banditry. When the Arthurian legends were rewritten gradually starting in 1485 by Thomas Mallory and gradually romanticized, the masterless knight, the hedge knight, became known as the knight errant. In fact, Sir Gawain of the Arthurian legends was the first knight to be called a knight errant in the tale of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight in the 14th century. And later stories followed about knights who rejected the feudal system and traveled the countryside, righting wrongs, rescuing princesses, competing anonymously in tournaments for the favor of chaste ladies, and of course, fighting monsters like dragons and ogres. And it's exactly this sort of depiction that stories like Don Quixote deconstruct. The romantic ideal of the chivalrous, landless knight errant. The wandering knight in shining armor. And it's also the same sort of archetype that Martin is so good at deconstructing and that has earned him his reputation for brutal medieval authenticity. And hopefully, any day now, we'll find out what happens next. We just wish he'd stop hedging and commit to a release date already. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash GM Word of the Week. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com.